Thanks everyone for waking up this morning and uh, dragging yourself uh, to this uh, talk on startup democracy. And I'm, I'm really pleased to be having this discussion because this is um, the beginnings of a project that I'm thinking about. So as you'll see, it's kind of in the uh, conceptual and narrative stages. And uh, I'd, I'd love to uh, have any feedback. So what I'm aiming to do is sketch a way of thinking about how to make democracy better. And so um, some talks like this kind of probe a lot into what is democracy and how do we think about it. And we'll get to that a little bit. But the focus of my talk is really on how to make American democracy better and sketching a quite a different perspective on that. Uh, and so. To begin, we got to think about what democracy is, just to get some terms on the table. And of course, the word, the English word, comes from two Greek words, demos and kratos, which means people and power. It's a system in which, system of government by the whole population. And the project takes off with some thoughts about uh, the ways in which the United States right now, as it's governed, falls short of this ideal of being a system of government by the whole population. How would we know whether or not America is a democracy? One way to think about it is that we have elections. Candidates run against each other. But a lot of people have elections that uh, we think of, a lot of systems have elections that we think of as somewhat democratically challenged. So another way to think about democracy is to ask whether or not government responds to the people. What does it mean for government to respond to the people? And for this, I rely on my friend uh, Marty Gillens uh, and his book, Affluence and Influence. He's a political scientist at Princeton University. And his idea of responsiveness is that the larger the proportion of people who want some policy change, the greater the probability that government will change that policy. Right? So this is, you can think of this as an opinion to policy response curve. And if the line is kind of uh, up like this, then government is very responsive. If few people want the policy to change, the probability that it changes is low. Conversely, if a lot of people want the policy to change, the probability that it changes is high. Uh, the green line would be a responsive government. The red line, a non-responsive government. So how responsive is American government? Over the last few decades, if you look across all policies and all opinions, Marty finds that the American government is fairly responsive with a couple of caveats. So you know, a lot of people can want a policy to change, and the probability is only 40% that it will change. Um, and that's because government has a lot of inertia by design, and so there's a status quo bias, right? But that's not bad, uh, because we might want a preference for uh, stability. And this is actually, this curve looks pretty good, because at least it's kind of going the right way in a pretty steady way. So not bad overall. But then, if we drill down a little bit and ask, how responsive is government to different parts of the population? And so what Marty does is he looks at policies on which people with different incomes actually have some difference of opinion with one another. And there are social policies, tax policies, uh, et cetera. A lot of policies are like that. And what he finds is that government is very, very responsive to the top decile of the population but non-responsive to the bottom decile of the population, right? And you might think, well, you know, that's not great. You'd like the curves to be going the same way for uh, everybody. But it's not so surprising either because the voting uh, rates of the top 9 of the top 10% are much higher than the voting rates of the bottom 10% uh, etc. And so it's not all that surprising that government isn't so responsive to people at the very bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. What is somewhat more responsive is that government is not even responsive to the uh, person at the middle of the income distribution. Right? And so there's a, there's a very old uh, theory in political science that says that uh, parties, all politicians and parties converge to the median voter because they want to slice off more and more. Um, of the electorate. And so they all go to the middle so that the left gets half of the voters and the right gets half of the voters. 
if we think on these issues, that turns out not to be the case. On issues where there is a difference between what wealthy people and everybody else thinks, wealthy people get their way, and the middle of the income distribution, the person at the 50% uh, the doesn't. And, and this line looks like it's curving upward a little bit, but it's not statistically significant. And indeed, Marty finds that where there are these differences of opinion, American government is responsive to the top 10% of the population and not to anyone else. So, on Marty's account, American government right now for the last couple of decades has been a system of government that is responsive to the top 10% of the population, falls somewhat short of our ideal of democracy sketched as the response curve. So what do we do? And a lot of people have thought that the way to reform frontal, uh, way to reform democracy is what I like to think of as a frontal assault. We've got to tackle the big institutions of democracy through campaign finance reform or maybe through redistricting, um, but uh, tackle the big, big institutions, get lobbying and politics out of, uh, lobbying out of politics, et cetera. I think of those as frontal assault approaches, and I think of them that way because right now in the foreseeable, my estimation is that the probability of success of those frontal assaults is very low. Uh, just as the uh, probability of success of a frontal assault in World War I was quite low. Um, in World War I, it was because they'd invented the machine gun. I think in the current period, there's lots of reasons, a couple of which are the Supreme Court captured in Citizens United and the McCutcheon decision. So is there another way to think about how to make democracy better? And I want to uh, explore a way of thinking about democratic reform through the lens of smaller startup projects. And just like the technical revolution, the technological revolution did not come from the big incumbent institutions and companies like, at that point, people don't even remember some of these companies like Digital Equipment Corporation or IBM, I guess people still remember a little bit. But it, it didn't come from those guys, right? It came from garages, and these were uh, the, the Steve, Steve Wozniak, and Steve Jobs before anybody heard of them working on uh, an Apple II there, for people who remember that computer. Um, and so what I'd like to do is draw an analogy and say just like the technological, the digital technology revolution came from unexpected corners, small players inventing things and finding solutions, maybe democratic reform in America will come from similar sources. And here, we have to think of democracy not, as, not only as what national government in Washington does, but democracy as a system of government, as a system of rule, of order, in which people exercise more power over their lives. And so I want to tell three stories about startup democracy, three little startup democracy stories that get, give you a little sense of what I have in mind. There's a story about work, a story about young people, and a story about politics. The story of work begins with farm workers in Florida, in a place called Immokalee, Florida. And people, um, Stephen Greenhouse in the New York Times wrote a great uh, feature piece on this a couple of weeks ago that people may have seen. But the effort has been going on uh, uh, for many years, since, since the mid-90s. And Immokalee, Florida is the place in the United States where almost all of the fresh tomatoes that are sold in grocery stores come from, uh, and that's been true for a while. The people who pick those tomatoes are uh, almost exclusively immigrant workers, most of them undocumented. And Immokalee, for decades, has been a place of horrible, horrible labor conditions. Most of the human trafficking and slavery charges that were brought in the United States were brought in Immokalee, Florida. Physical and sexual abuse in the fields it was uh, commonplace, and wages uh, were uh, nominally low and uh, often unpaid. Right, uh, and the uh, um, the situation democratically was one in which workers had very little voice or influence over some of the most important decisions affecting their lives, decisions at work. And um, workers in Immokalee, Florida had been organizing since the mid-90s for a long time without much success until they uh, hit upon a strategy 
in which they thought they might reach out to consumers who buy tomatoes. And the first kinds of consumers that they reached out to were students. And so this is a, a kind of Immokalee worker student protest at Ohio State University that was uh, pressing businesses operating on the universities to care more about where the tomatoes came from. And what they ended up doing, Immokalee, uh, recently, is forging agreements with a lot of companies that buy fresh tomatoes. The first one was Taco Bell, later on Trader Joe's and Whole Foods, and just a couple of weeks ago, the Walmart Corporation, which um, is remarkable for, for people who follow corporate social responsibility kinds of issues. And what they do is they get companies, these purchasers, to pay a penny a pound more for tomatoes to the growers. And in exchange, the growers have to sign on to a code of conduct. And this is a very demanding code of conduct. Um, and so the code of conduct compels growers to pay the workers a little bit more to uh, agree to working conditions, the monitoring of working conditions, and better working conditions, uh, and to abide by a whole process of judgment, investigation, and adjudication whenever there's uh, an accusation from somebody working in the fields that the growers have violated the code of conduct, right? And the worker, the growers, excuse me, have an enormous incentive to abide by this code of conduct because if they are found in violation of the code of conduct, they uh, risk being kicked out of the coalition, <coughs> which is the uh, fair food uh, coalition. And if they're not in the fair food coalition, then they can't sell their tomatoes anymore to the buyers that signed on to this agreement, to Walmart, Taco Bell, uh, et cetera. Right? And so what this uh, this kind of project of, uh, that I'm calling Startup Democracy does is it uh, compels growers to listen to the uh, voice and heed the needs of people who had very little voice and um, whose needs were being ignored beforehand, the farm workers, through this kind of clever loop of um, generating a code of conduct that growers have to adhere to and have very strong uh, incentives to do that. Now, uh, an interesting part of this story is what's not part of the story, and what's not part of the story is government. Government is not part of this story, I think, for a couple of reasons. The first reason, and I only recently found this out, is um, most states don't even have a state-level regulatory enforcement body for agricultural labor. Right, so uh, the I, and, and in Florida in particular, the political situation was such that if uh, if the farm workers tried to go through the formal political apparatus, they would have faced a huge number of barriers because of the influence of large growers in Florida. Right, so that's reason one is the political the that is the formal political governmental channel of vindicating their rights rights and voice was blocked off. Number two is, uh, you know, when you talk to people in the coalition of Immokalee workers, they think that governmental enforcement is, is very, very slow. And so you look at uh, a labor grievance, it often takes a long, long time to get that worked out. In the private system of monitoring that has been established in uh, Immokalee, grievances are resolved in between two and six weeks. So it's a very, very fast turnaround. And the punishments are stiff. If it's found, for instance, that a crew boss is sexually harassing a female or any, any uh, farm worker with contact, with physical contact, then the grower has to dismiss that crew boss immediately or they get kicked out of the Fair Food Coalition. Um, so that is the first startup story of work. The second startup, oh, yeah, hi. And in the absence of <clears throat> government or union or things like that, how does some uh, you know sort of a democratic action like this go to scale? Because with scale obviously comes bureaucracy and it slows down and things like that. But how does this go beyond Immokalee? So I think there's a couple of ways that it could go beyond Immokalee, and that's a great question. One way is through developing this as a model that diffuses to other um, other kinds of workers who want to 
try to use this as kind of a supply chain model of improving labor standards, right? They could do that, right? That's one way, which is a horizontal diffusion, which is one way to get to scale. Another way to get to scale, and this is more controversial, is that government could get involved, right? Uh, and there have been lots of proposals um, for the Labor Department to uh, do labor standards monitoring and enforcement in a way that empowers organized people at work. Uh, opponents of that kind of measure have called it vigilante regulation, right? Uh, another, uh, the proponents of that kind of uh, modification of how labor regulation is done have called it uh, co-production of regulation, right? Cooperative regulation. Uh, so there are ways, you know, if, uh, if public policy did change, or if somebody were able to change public policy, it could be easily be changed in ways that put a thumb on the scale toward fostering and spreading this kind of thing. In Immokalee, the pragmatic judgment was that those policy levers were not available. Um, okay, so the second story is a story about youth. And this one's just beginning, so it doesn't really have uh, results yet, at least in, in the case that I'm going to talk about. Um, and this is a story about participatory budgeting. How many people have heard about participatory budgeting? So uh, for those people who've heard about participatory budgeting, uh, it is a uh, policy design that began in the city of uh, Porto Alegre, Brazil, in the southern part of Brazil. And the initiative, uh, what it does is it allows ordinary people through a directly democratic process to allocate where public money goes. And in particular, in Porto Alegre, it was a big part of the infrastructure portion of the city budget was shifted from city hall decision making to this process of direct democracy where everybody in every neighborhood got to decide where to allocate those, that money. So if you were in your neighborhood and your whole neighborhood decided, well, for us the first priority is electrification and then we want a community center and then we want some street paving, that's what happened to the share of money that would go to your neighborhood. Right? So that's participatory budgeting. It has since, uh, Puerto Alegre did this in the early 90s, uh, since then, it has spread to 1,500 cities all over the world in various forms. Um, the first adopters in the United States are Chicago, New York, and Vallejo, California, for reasons I don't exactly understand why Vallejo is in there. Um, but Boston is a, uh, I guess, you know, as the, in the first half dozen cities to experiment with this, I guess you could call that not a laggard, but still pretty much on the leading edge given the number of cities that are in the United States. But Boston has come up with a particularly interesting variant of participatory budgeting under the Mignino administration, and Mayor Walsh has decided to <coughs> continue it, in which it's a youth-focused participatory budgeting. So the city of Boston has decided to allocate $1 million, and this process is kind of going on right now for young people, and by young, they mean roughly 10 to 18, to propose projects to each other, and then any young person is eligible to propose a project and to vote on which projects they want, and the winning projects will, uh, that's what the million dollars will be spent on. And it's a complicated process because, um, you know, the city is involved and in kind of helping people figure out what's, you know, if you design a, a skate park with a feature that you know, defies the laws of gravity and can't be built, that's probably not so good. So they get a lot of uh, kind of technical help doing that kind of thing. Uh, and the process is kind of ongoing right now. This is the first round of it, so we don't know whether the projects will be good or, or even whether the city will follow through and build them. Uh, but I think it's very exciting. In uh, some interviews with some of the young people are, who are involved, they just can't believe that it's happening, that anyone would give them enough authority over public money, you know, much less a million dollars to do anything. So it's extremely empowering and invigorating for them. Um, it's interesting that the city of Boston, their main motivation for doing this is not to get great projects, but to get more young people involved civically, right? So they see this as primarily a uh, civic education and civic socialization exercise. And so they're primarily interested in whether or not it does that, whether or not it brings more young people into the process, whether they stay engaged, what they think about government and community life, et cetera. 
the early versions of participatory budgeting were about civic engagement, but they were much more about social justice. So there, the explicit aim, like in Porto Alegre and many Latin American cities, of participatory budgeting was to shift who got benefits from city government, in particular to shift investment to uh, more to poorer sections of cities. Yeah, Marco, this is fascinating. Could you just say a word about how this started in Porto Alegre? It's an idea, or a few people got together in terms of origins of democratic change. Yeah, and so exactly that's really important. Some, just very quickly, I know it's not your theme today, but how successful has participatory budgeting been in all those dots? Yeah, um, those are two great questions. So um, it's really important to understand uh, that the origins of participatory budgeting in Porto Alegre are not the origins of participatory budgeting in any of the American cases. And the origins of participatory budgeting in Porto Alegre are that it was a, um, it was the brainchild of a left party, the PK, called the Workers' Party. And they win elections because their natural base is, consists of very active social movements, left social movements in the city, who have not a Leninist, but a more participatory, engaged tradition. Right? And so uh, the Pete was winning you know, 40, 50% of elections, but they were losing a lot for the municipal executive. And they said they came up with this as an electoral innovation. They said, you vote for us, we will institute participatory budgeting, which means you get to decide what happens with a bunch of the city money. They didn't know exactly what that would mean, um, but it was just a word. So they got elected, and then they had to deliver, and it took them you know, an electoral cycle to figure out exactly how to do participatory budgeting. And once they did that, it was so popular that they kept winning mayoral elections for the next 10, 15 years, right? Because they got to claim credit for this um, governance innovation that turned out to be extremely popular. Um, in the US, the origins are not that. This is actually, this, Boston and Vallejo are the first participatory budgeting projects that come out of the mayor's office. In New York and Chicago, it comes out of the offices of dissident city councilors who don't like the mayor. <laughs> and so in New York and Chicago, uh, all women and city councilors get a little kitty of money, a million dollars, you know, on that, on that order of magnitude. And they said, we will, um, it was electoral for them as well, right? They said, well, instead of us deciding which potholes to fill in, we'll create a system of participatory budgeting. And they did that as an electoral strategy, but it was also a way to challenge the political machine and the, the kind of um, stick it to the mayor. Um, and in, as it spreads, there's a fascinating work by Giampaolo Biacci about the changing meaning of participatory budgeting as it spreads. And this is a diffusion question. So for, you know, Kennedy School students, um, you can diffuse a policy that looks the same on paper but has very different meaning on the ground. And that's what Giampaolo argues is he says, look, some of these early cases of participatory budgeting are really about social justice. Right, about distributing the benefits of public investment more equitably. But as it spreads, its meaning changes. And um, he would look to the Boston case as effective in that regard, because it's not about social justice anymore. It's just about for him, civic engagement, which is a less important project for him than social justice. And a lot of these other cases, they get kind of hollowed out of their mobilization, of the kind of political mobilization piece and of the, the social justice piece. Arthur. What's striking about the two examples that you uh, gave so far is that neither of the target groups that are being benefited off the spinning are actually, by law, active citizens. Right? They're, they're uh, undocumented workers and kids who sure. are, are yeah. members. And of course, yeah. the, second, the second one is training wheels that are eventually going to become, and maybe behind the first yes. one is the idea that undocumented workers ought to be full-fledged citizens. But I mean, all well, this is marvelous, but exactly what makes this democracy, and suppose the following, suppose that 90% of the actual active voters in these jurisdictions are against these projects, these wonderful projects. Mm -hmm. um, they're still wonderful projects, but what makes them democratic projects? It makes them, well, <laughs> I'll get to that uh, okay. toward the end. I wanted to tell the stories first, but that is a, okay. a good question that um, people, that is de debatable as yeah. Yeah. Uh, part of this project and where it's going, okay. Okay. is about who's in the demos. Yeah. Okay. So the third story is about voters. Okay. Um, it's a story of politics. 
And it's a story of um, gerrymandering as a way, the problem of gerrymandering, I think it's, it's fair to say, reduces the influence of people, the equitable influence of people over their electoral system. Um, and, you know, every, I think probably most folks know, but I'll just kind of rehearse it in a line. The problem with the way that districts are drawn in most places in the United States, electoral districts are drawn, is that politicians draw them, elected politicians draw them. And whereas voters may want all kinds of things out of a political map, they may want fairness, they want, may want competitiveness, they may want the integrity of their communities, they may even want just compactness, you know, kind of a ra rationality and coherent sense. Mainly what, citizen, what, what sitting politicians want is to be reelected. And so the effect of uh, a procedure which puts the power of drawing lines on electoral districts to, um, uh, in the hands of sitting politicians is that they end up drawing maps which are very different from maps would have been, which would have been drawn to vindicate citizens' interests at large. And so this uh, Startup Democracy Project, uh, this third one on politics, begins in 2008, a little bit before that, but it kind of crystallizes in 2008 uh, with California's Proposition 11. This is a, one of the rare, to my mind, good stories about the, the California direct democracy process. California Prop Election, the Voters' First Act, which passed 51-49% in a uh, referendum in um, 2008. And what it did was it said that the process of creating uh, our next electoral map for state level elections will be uh, drawn by a citizens assembly, not by sitting politicians anymore. And in particular, uh, it created a process, a convoluted process, in which anyone in California could apply to be on the Citizens Redistricting Commission. 30,000 people applied. A couple of my students, or one of my students in uh, the, my professional ethics course this semester actually applied. He didn't get selected. I guess you know, one out of 30,000 chances are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty uh, slim. And then uh, the State Bureau of Audits, according to a set of criteria that they were given uh, that had to do with diversity and competence and uh, lack of conflict of interest and several other things, selected 622 of those 30,000 that they deemed most qualified to be on the California Citizens Redistricting Commission. And then 14 people were selected to be on that commission, eight of them from a random draw of these 622, and six selected for diversity because that was very important. Um, and it ended up being five Democrats, five Republicans, and four from neither majority party. It should be um, noted that uh, the left part of the political spectrum really, really opposed this measure, including Nancy Pelosi, including the Asian Americans and uh, the Asian American groups, the Latino groups, and the African American groups really didn't like this. Governor Schwarzenegger did like this. I like it too. Um, and so what they ended up doing to draw the maps were they had 34 public hearings in which they heard uh, 2,700 speakers, had 70 uh, meetings, deliberation meetings um, among themselves uh, to uh, kind of figure out what the maps should look like, 22,000 written submissions, and out of that they uh, tried to draw maps that met five criteria of population equality, obviously that's very, very important, uh, to have a satisfy Voting Rights Act requirements and have uh, minority representation, geographic uh, continuity, and to have communities of interest, kind of you know, sensible lines around towns and communities and so on, and geographic compactness, so you, know, you shouldn't have a district that runs along the side of a highway for miles and miles and miles and it's very thin, right? Um, a couple of questions. Were the maps legitimate? Uh, voters familiar with the process approved of it two to one in a public opinion survey. The California Supreme Court, in a, couple, in a decision challenging the constitutionality of the maps, upheld the process seven to zero. 
They said, not only do the commission's uh, certified Senate districts appear to comply with all the constitutionally mandated criteria, the commission's certified Senate districts are also a product of an open, transparent, nonpartisan redistricting process. So people like the process, and people like the maps, too. And so several uh, good government groups, including the Public Policy Institute of California, League of Women Voters, National Journal. National Journal did a study and showed that uh, after this redistricting process, California had some of the most competitive districts um, in the nation. Right. Um, all of uh, these good government groups thought the maps were quite good maps. So the substance seems to be approved, at least by uh, good government uh, criteria. And then it actually did have a, uh, an effect, uh, along with a, a couple of other reforms on California elections. Henry Waxman faced the toughest uh, battle after this. The Brennan Center said there are nine safe, less safe congressional seats. So part of the story is that this process, shortly after uh, they used it to draw state level elections, they had another referendum that passed by a much larger margin that expanded the California Citizens Redistricting Commission's um, jurisdiction to cover congressional elections as well, right? And so it, it, passed, it kind of has increasing legitimacy as a body that draws uh, political acts, <laughs> right? And then now uh, turnover is significantly higher than it was before. Okay, so um, just a few more comments and now I uh, kind of get to Arthur's question a little bit. How do we think of why count these things, these three stories, the story of work, the story of young people, and the story of politics and redistricting, as democracy at all. What does it mean to think about democracy in this way, given the first two stories weren't even about people who have the right to vote, by and large, right? And so my uh, idea of democracy is uh, different, contested, but very simple, I think. Uh, and the idea is that there are constituents out there, and some of them have the right to vote, some of them don't. Uh, but all of them are affected by decisions that large organizations make. Right? And in the case of work, it was decisions of growers who employ them. In the case of young people, it's decisions of the city and the school system. And in the voting case in California, it's decisions of the legislature or whoever it is determines how people get to vote. And the problem of, a central problem of democracy arises in which there's a, when there's an influence gap, in which organizations are making all sorts of decisions and taking actions that affect these folks, but they don't have any way to influence the decisions that those organizations are making. And then what a startup democracy project is, is a project in which the constituency gets engaged with some startup effort. And sometimes they form that effort, but sometimes, more often, it's an entrepreneur that says, look, these people don't have any voice, and I want to fix that. And I have an idea about how to fix that. I'm going to start uh, organizing these guys to lobby students who buy tacos from Taco Bell, right? Or I'm going to lobby the mayor to slice off some of the capital budget for young people to decide, because I feel like young people don't have any voice, right? So it's a startup project that tries to remedy this voice gap. And it's a startup in the sense that it's oftentimes an entrepreneur, but an entrepreneur who has an idea about how to remedy that voice gap that other people haven't tried before. Or maybe they've tried them before, but not with the gusto and cleverness of implementation. And so uh, sometimes it's about direct participation. Sometimes it's about changing laws and regulation. Sometimes it's about changing culture. I mean, you could view um, some of the marriage equality uh, work as a startup democracy effort that worked primarily on this domain of norms and popular culture, right? And it's a successful startup democracy effort when the idea presses the organization to close the voice gap. That's what a startup democracy is. Yeah. So oftentimes in the context of democracy, you hear about the tyranny of the majority. And I bring this up because I work in a relatively large uh, membership organization. And we have um, a group that would probably fit your criteria for a startup democracy project. Um, and uh, they, if their ideas got mentioned, 
or if their ideas got implemented, um, it would likely lower the overall good for the for the organization. And so, so the question is, um, you know, in the context of um, you know sort of the the tyranny of the majority needing to protect sort of the voices that are around the margins of democracy, then how do you balance those two things with participation? Uh, well, this is a kind of version of, of Arthur's question, right? Um, and I don't have a good answer to that. I mean, the answer would have to be something that says, well, which startup democracies get to happen and which ones don't, which ones are pushing in uh, directions of people who have too much voice and control and influence already, right? And, and you know, that's a good question. I think kind of empirically out there, uh, we don't have great answers to that. Uh, I'm a little bit less worried about that right now, I think, because why? Because my focus is on the areas in which I think the voice gap is greatest, right? And so it's by definition stipulation, people who have less voice than they should, if you accept this account. Um, but I mean, th this is a, a very good set of issues. And so the picture here is startup democracy everywhere in city planning, in work family life, in healthcare, in pensions and investments, in infrastructure projects, which we already talked about a little bit. And that is the picture of democratic reform. It's not that everybody signs on to a single program like campaign finance reform or redistricting that's going to solve the problem. No, that's not the picture of democratic reform. The picture of democratic reform here is that there's millions of entrepreneurs looking for places where people don't have enough voice, where there's a voice, where there's an influence gap, and they're coming up with ideas about how to fix that influence gap. And so the idea of leadership is not an idea of leadership in which there's a dozen or several dozen people architecting a whole democratic system that's really good for everybody. No. It is a picture in which everybody is nominating, or uh, not everybody, but a lot of people, a lot of creative people are trying to think about innovative solutions to bridge these uh, situations in which there's tons of people who are excluded and who are being pushed out and have an idea about how to make that better. Right, what definition of leadership is that leadership? Participation, yes. Involvement, yes. Leadership? It's an idea of leadership in which um, somebody, well, there's several components. One, a leader, right? It's not just participation, right? The participation part um, is these people getting involved, right? That's the participation part. The leadership part is somebody who has the uh, gumption to uh, think of a project, uh, has a vision about how to bridge this gap and um, sketches a way forward for how to do that and uh, bringing enough people along to get that project off the ground. But it's not, um, it's, it's not just a hierarchical notion of leadership but because to, it would be a hierarchical notion of leadership if a bunch of just interest groups and lobbies counted in that green box. But that's not the idea. The idea is that they have to create a way for these people I to become agree. engaged I as agree well. I agree that's leadership. That's entrepreneurial leadership. Yeah. And that's very powerful. In a way, so was Thomas Jefferson. But anyway, yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm not denying that. <laughs> yeah. What I'm worried about is your picture. You use leadership to describe all those people going like this. And I think that di dilutes and defames the notion of what it means to show leadership. So if you look at your constituents, Mm -hmm. Think about particularly about the Imolaki example, yeah. which is very powerful. Unless it in some way gives the folks, the tomato growers, the tomato pickers themselves, some sense of empowerment, yes. their voice. Yes. And if it does, then I would think inevitably some of them are going to show more leadership among their peers about what you want to voice and what you want to say than others. Is that part of the process, or is that just a byproduct that nobody studies? It's a part of some of the processes. It's a part, certainly it's a part of the Immokalee process. In the Boston youth case, it works in a much less, well, 
No, it's actually part of that process too, because there are youth leaders who step up onto the rulemaking and steering committees and so on, right? Um, but I guess I, I, I don't want to say that it's a necessary part of all of these processes. Um, because sometimes there's a leader and an entrepreneur who comes up with the idea and, and is like uh, you know, founding fathers in this smaller space and architects a way in which these people have more voice and control. And that's it. Um, right? But and this is a good, that's a great question actually because in the cases that I think of, it's actually not like that. It, the entrepreneur also establishes an organization in which other people gain skills and climb up a, a chain of leadership. So, you know, one that I'm not going to talk about is, is workplace democracy efforts. And the ones in the United States like that, you might want to look at them. Um, uh, New Belgium Brewing Company, when you're out at the bar tonight, buy a beer from them because it's a worker, a worker owned and operated. King, King Arthur Flower. Those cases are ones in, that are like this, in which there's an entrepreneur who starts a company company in this case, but thinks that it should be governed by um, and, and highly participatory with workers. But an essential part of that is developing the skills and competencies of some of those workers to climb up a leadership. So that's a good question. I, I, I wanted to resist kind of what you said, right? Because some people are leaders in the entrepreneur sense. But maybe if you look at the empirical cases, it's more like what you said than what I just said. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> I, I wonder if um, you, you ever find a need to distinguish between democracy and government, so whether it's being led by elected officials or <coughs> government agencies. So um, I've worked on a lot of projects for a few years in Australia and the U.S. In, uh, under the sort of Gov 2.0 peer-to-peer -peer banner, and we found that um, in, a, in a parliamentary system, they were particularly concerned about who has the authority <coughs> to engage the public in what way on what decision-making process. Um, and it was sometimes arbitrary. The ministers would either uh, back what we were doing or drive it, and other times they didn't seem to care, even though it had implications for democracy. So for example, we were involving citizens in finding out what was happening with bushfires through apps and this sort of thing. And in that case, it was considered, again, kind of arbitrarily, stakeholder engagement that government agencies, in this case, the Department of Justice, should engage in. In other cases, they thought, if this is going to be about democracy, only a minister or a, a, a premier or someone could do it, or, or at least authorize it. I think maybe in America, in the US, we don't necessarily draw as hard a line, um, although, as you say, in participatory budgeting, it's sometimes city councilors, sometimes a mayor. Do you see that? And it seems like some of these questions were bumping up against where do you define democracy? Where do you define representative government? Um, yeah, uh, you know that's. Uh, I uh, want to resist those distinctions, okay. right? Yeah. So the idea here. And I like to resist it too, but I, yeah. So the idea here is that anyone can do a startup democracy project. Yeah. It could be the kids in that picture raising their hands. Yeah. It could be a minister. Uh, part a, a key actor in the California case actually. Um, was a multimillionaire who's the son of one of Warren Buffett's partners, who's a Republican good governor reformer, who put a few million dollars to support the referendum proposition, mm. right? And so it could come from many, many different places, but what it's, what's, it, it could come from the bureaucracy. A lot of these come from the bureaucracy, right? right? right. Um, as well as from outside government. The important thing is that it's somebody targeting a voice gap and somebody with a new idea about how to push it forward. Now, um, what you say is very, very familiar to me, and I'm surprised at how much this piece of it has changed. So, you know, five years ago, I think it was just, just five years ago, you know, when I talked to elected officials in the United States, but a lot of other places too, and I talked to them about, I mean, it wasn't exactly startup democracy, but it was participatory democracy, right? Citizens getting involved in making decisions, right? Almost universally, the reaction is, well, why? I mean, that's, that's what they elect me to do. What, right. What's the point of that, right? And you still hear plenty of that, but just much, much less common yeah. than <laughs> usual. So I, I, you know, I kind of asked the Boston people about this and, um, and people in other cities that are playing with participatory budgeting, 
and just say that, yeah, we just don't hear that. That's not, in, in, to my account about what politicians were, elected officials were saying five years ago, now you talk to people involved in government and a lot of these um, initiatives, and it, it just doesn't have any resonance, whereas before it was the universal refrain. So, right. I don't know what's going on there. I don't yeah. have an explanation. You know, yeah. that's just a change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if this is helpful, but you started by saying that this is an idea that, you, that you're working on. And it, it seems to me that the biggest premise for this graph that you're showing us is that there's a voice gap. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I'm sitting here wondering if there's a listening gap. Mm -hmm. And maybe, I, I, I totally understand the problems that you're showing us, but if you change the question, instead of saying there's a voice gap and say there's a listening gap, it might also change the outcome. The, the listening problem. gap on the part of government. On the part of government. Yeah, that's, I think that's true. So if it were the case that there were no voice gaps, right, and the easiest way to close up these voice gaps was to increase the listening, then I think that's what you should do. Then you wouldn't need, you know, you wouldn't need this. So, right? and, this and would work. This would be I'm, fine. What I'm so, trying to say yeah. is that opens up a whole new set of startup initiatives from ah, both I organizations see. Yes. as well. I think it's, it's it, yeah, you have two arrows for some reason. And those actions could also be listening actions. Yes, yes. No, I agree. I agree. And, and, and you could have startups coming from the constituents. You could also have startup democracy coming from the organization. Coming from the organ and from government, right? So I think you know, some of the, the stakeholder deliberations in Australia and many other places are exactly efforts to do that, to listen a little bit better. And you see a lot of this in the EU context, especially because everybody is complaining that they Brussels and they don't listen. So you see a bunch of efforts to uh, at least display some mechanisms of listening. Whether or not listening is actually occurring is a different question. But the point is very well taken. It, you know, the startup democracy effort could come from um, government trying to listen better. And that is a way of closing out the voice gap. And you're, this, this is the important thing for me, is that it be closed. Yeah, yeah another way to think about this is, so you've talked about organizing the constituency you know, the delivery channel, but, uh, you know, in our work, uh, it's more about organizing the organization. Uh, and uh, the actor on the organization side is the part that's broken. Um, and how do you get around the gatekeeper? The decision, you know, it's a democratic organization, but there's always a decision maker who can be the yes or no who's within the bureaucracy. So. Um, some of what we do is getting around, getting around that gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. So that's another, I think, role that sort of, you know, uh, democracy projects can do is, it, like your first example is getting around the uh, the, the non-acting actor. Right, the non-acting labor standards enforcer yeah. in that case. Right. So I mean, I think that hinges on the creativity over here, and this is the creative part and the strategic part of figuring out why exactly there's a voice gap. You know, maybe it's because the organization just uh, hasn't thought about it or inertia, or maybe there are really strong interests in the organization that are uh, in favor of not having very much voice, right? And then, then the strategic part is about figuring out how to push that organization, whether it's through direct participation or through, well, you know, one of these, like Taco Bell, right? A lot of people not wanting to listen initially, and there it was through uh, direct participation, right, in the form of, of protests, and that changed norms and culture, right. So there's it, that is the, I guess the short answer is the way to change the internal operation here, and that's always essential, I think, is um, kind of denoted here. It's part of the strategic and creative part. That's a large part of the startup effort. Yeah. I'm um struck by, in particular, say, the participatory budgeting and how it has some analogies to like, crowdsourcing and other forms of that. And, and so in many ways, I think about the voice gap and clearly you know, there's all these ways in which social media have helped address that. And yet, I'm struck by the fact that in all of your examples, um, sort of technology didn't appear to be at the forefront <coughs> of having regarded this innovation. 
And I'm just kind of curious as to whether you see it as being a, a key component of it, or, or actually really is sort of a red herring. And in some ways, this is as much about you know people being able to convene and and forward their ideas to address these voice gaps. Right. If you come to my uh, one o'clock talk <laughs> and hear about the digital part, you know, my line on this is that um, usually the big barriers are uh, on the political and organizational side. And so if you can fix those barriers, then there's a chance for technology really amplifying the effects of some of these loops. The technology by itself I think almost never can create voice where there was none before. So just as an example of this, right, if you look at your, congr your member of Congress or your senator's website and try to like, tell them something through their website, it's a terrible interface. It's worse than email, actually, right? It's a little form where you put in your, and then you like maybe click down your problem category, and then you get to write a sentence, and, and that's it. That's not a technology problem, right? I don't, I don't know how many people in this room can code, but you know anybody who can, it would take them half an hour to develop a better interface that would be more interactive and that would create more listening, right? It's not a technological problem. It's a political problem. They don't want to hear it. And so you've got to solve the problem of they don't want to hear it. And then once they do want to hear it, the technology can help a lot. But unless you deal with that first thing, Going back to your initial question, so this is a project about how to make democracy better. I'm wondering what you would say to a, a Philip Petit or someone who might come out with a thicker concept of um, maybe not just influence but popular control, like having to show control ultimately over the, the outcomes of the process. If you're scaling up the startup democracy project to the electoral cycle and the electoral process, would, would this ultimately give you? <coughs> control or is, is influence enough? Um, well, I guess my, my view is uh, much more <coughs> decentralized and fragmented than, uh, than a concept of republicanism, you know, writ large or something like that. So really, the influence, you're, you're right, you didn't say voice as it is on this slide. It's really influence, and that's the word I use. This is the wrong word. It should say influence. but. Um, for me, it's proportionate influence is the standard, right? Some rough standard of exercising influence over decisions in proportion to the um, impact of those decisions on your life, right? And so it's looser. It's not, a, it's not an image of complete popular control, at least not at this point, because I think for most of these things, um, it's hard to parse out how all the actors are. And there's no, um, <clears throat> there's no homogenizing category like citizen, right? Where popular control of citizens qua citizen, you can understand that, right? Either in an aggregative sense or a deliberative sense. Here, with any organization, there are so many different um, kinds of actors and, and influences involved. Like I was thinking about going through an education case, education policy case, right? There's students, there's parents, there's teachers, there's administrators. It's a more kind of complicated view and it, I think it's difficult to figure out a common denominator like one person, one vote in that sort of situation. So in a way, influence is a way of fudging that unevenness and lack of homogeneity of, of how to think about the participants. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, I'm from Brazil. Um, I was also um, like listening a lot about what was happening at, uh, at Porto Alegre in the 90s and stuff and how it spread out. And last year, as I'm sure you know, there were like lots of protests and now there's going to be even more with the World Cup coming up and now we have, um, we have elections for, for president in like the middle of the year. Yes. Um, something that's happening in Brazil right now is the fact that um, well, actually last year when the government was completely stunned by these protests that had tens of millions of people on the streets in a completely distributed way that literally on Facebook, less of Twitter, but like it just spread out like wildfire and nobody actually knew what was going on. People are trying to pick out the leaders and that's why I wanted to, to speak to your question. 
And guess what? There are no leaders. It's distributed. The leadership is actually distributed over a network that is so diffused that it's it's almost impossible to to like pinpoint like where the leadership is and what the issues actually are because everyone was so discontent about everything, like this whole cloud of issues from like governance to bad politicians to bad situations in in the economy and stuff. So like my question to you is in a situation like this where um, <clears throat> Where the constituency is so large, and it's so um, it's so unhappy about so many things. Yes, they can create a start of the democracy project by going on by going on the street and like forcing people to to show in media what's going on and stuff. But like the agenda becomes so wide, yeah. And because of this distributed because leadership, it. yeah. it's so hard to have a dialogue in a productive manner with the folks that are holding the strings at the moment. How can you take that to the next level and actually make it more productive? I don't know if you can. Um, so I think that's a great issue. So my picture of startup democracy is more organized than what you just described, right? So it's somebody with or a set of people with a, a pretty clear idea and project that are trying to do things, structure participation, change laws and regulations, have a particular norm in line in mind. Same-sex people shouldn't get married. Let's change that norm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then they're kind of doing that, you know, just like Apple Computer or Facebook or Google or Twitter, right? With some focus and some um, intentionality in, a, in an organized and structured way. And what you're talking about, I think, is, is extreme and kind of loops into the technology question mm -hmm. a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and um, I think, you know, Nan might resist this idea that there's no leadership happening, um, or, or not. Maybe the problem is that there's not enough leadership happening, right? And so you saw this with the Brazil protest. It may be fair or unfair, but you could also characterize a bunch of the Arab Spring like this. You could think of Occupy like that as well, right? And so I think uh, my, my friend Marshall Gann's colleague puts it this way, is that um, before technology, you had to pay costs of organization and leadership development before you could mobilize lots of people. Because that's how you mobilize lots of people. Right? In the civil rights era, you had to build churches and lots of other kinds of organizations to get millions of people on the street. right? And now, with digital technology, uh, there are some things that go viral where you don't have to pay those costs of organization and leadership formation. And so you get mobilized movements that are unstructured and not very well organized. So now, right before you had to organize, before you could mobilize, now you can mobilize and even topple governments through that mobilization, right, without organization. And, and maybe it's really hard to get organized after you mobilize, yeah. right? And so um, the uh, people in social movements uh, that I talk to sometimes have characterized this as uh, the, the challenge of moving from moments to movements, right? And so the Brazil, Arab Spring, Occupy is a moment, but it's unstructured and unsustainable. It's not a deliberate project. It's, all those are much, much bigger than anything, you know, I've contemplated today in, in these remarks. But the challenge is, I think, a really important one. And so in that way, technology is actually bad for uh, kind of social change and, uh, and uh, kind of organized progress in that way because it makes mobilization too cheap. I think it's a fascinating problem. It's not well understood. So in this model, uh, what fascism and what in today, a country that already had a high degree of, or tradition of democracy. Um, but take, for example, my native country of Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anyone here, at least in this year, would say that Cuba is a democracy. If they organize themselves in such a way where a little of this model they, so you disaggregate these groups. And in particular factory, there's a great deal of participation. They get to decide what time you know, they get together, you know, what time you want to start, what time you want to end, uh, what you want to wear, that sort of thing. And so one can argue it's a very democratic process because they get to decide these things. But it's not, right? Because you're looking at a country that's slightly other than that. So how do you how do you go from this model to a country in the United States, we have the freedom to talk about these things in a country like Cuba, but we don't. Yeah, so I think there's two, two dimensions to that, uh, right? One is 
what is the broader environment like for people who have startup democracy projects, right? And I think in, in uh, the United States and other kind of constitutional democracies, that's a very favorable environment for people who want to nominate a problem and work on it because you have freedom of association and freedom of speech. And so that's a favorable environment, right? And so no, no question that um, the United States, I think, is better for startup democracies than, than China or Cuba, right? Um, the other question is, well, how, what is democracy? And um, would I count uh, workers at factories in Cuba being able to decide those things as democratic? Yes, I would, absolutely, right? But it's not sufficient, right? So the idea is, you know, anybody, that worker, you, me, we have all sorts of uh, interests and needs and values in our lives, and all sorts of organizations are making decisions that affect those things. And the situation you described in Cuba is one in which there is, I suppose, an opportunity to influence one set of organizations making those decisions, employers, right? But there are many other organizations in Cuba in that regime that for which there is a voice gap, right? And so the diagnosis would be, well, uh, what are those organizations and is it possible to close some of those voice gaps? So. Um, so I would say that uh, if it, you know, in, in a Yugoslavia, right, in places where historically, where there were um, worker controlled workplaces, that's an important kind of uh, check on the, yes, it's democratic in this sense scale, in an environment where government is not democratic, it's authoritarian, right? Government is one organization that's important, but there are many others, right? And so, you know, there's no easy way to add it up, but for Cuba, I would say, uh, I, I've never been to Cuba, I don't know the situation at all, but let's kind of stipulate that the workplace is democratic, that would be a thumbs up, but the fact that government is not democratic at all would be a big thumbs down. All right, I think we have to uh, close now, but thank you all very much for these stimulating comments. And the, um, the last part is I think that this view of democracy is very good for the Kennedy School because one of the things that it should be doing, and what the Kennedy School should be doing on this view is training students uh, at all levels who come through to be people who potentially create startup democracies. Thank you very much.